Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining the MIT Enterprise Forum of uh, Washington and Baltimore this afternoon. I'm Cynthia. I am MIT EFDC's chair. For those of you that aren't familiar, uh, the MIT Enterprise Forum of Washington is open to everyone. And our goal is to empower people to create great businesses that leverage technology. So on behalf of the entire MIT EFDC board, thanks for joining us. I hope everybody is staying well and safe during this really challenging time. I'd like to encourage everyone to take a personal moment of reflection, give some thoughts to those suffering from illnesses and suffering from injustice. Thanks. So this session on golf and technology is part of our Back to Business series of virtual events. Back to Biz is a series of engaging and interactive conversations, examining how tech, entrepreneurship, and innovation can improve our lives during, and will hopefully bring our businesses back after this whole healthcare crisis has passed us. So we wanted to offer a series of discussions that are unique from the most recent pandemic fair examine how technology, the investment landscape, the economy, obviously the pandemic are affecting our lives. So we thought as long as we're hunkering down, we take a look at the tech behind golf, maybe fix a swing or two while we're at it. So I want to thank our moderator, Abet Villacorta. Many of you, I think, may know him from the MIT Alumni Club of DC, where he's a board member and the resident golf expert, I might add. He's also a partner at Foley and Lardner, where he focuses on IP. Abed is an expert in corporate governance and has worked with both biotech startups and large pharmaceutical corporations in developing and enforcing IP rights and medical to medical products, systems, and services. And I also want to thank our entire panel, panel who are joining us from various uh, spots. Sean McDonald is joining us from Williamsburg, Virginia. She's the founder and president of Feedback Enterprise LLC, which she founded in 2012 to make individualized coaching accessible to everyone through the aid of technology. Feedback Solutions fuse the latest uh, markerless bio biometric motion capture technologies with artificial intelligence. The result is an individualized coaching experience based on science and fueled by tech. Uh, Stephen Slot Slaughterback is joining us from just outside Richmond. He served as the director of a. He currently serves as a director of instruction at Kinlock Golf Club in Richmond. He's been doing that since 2001. He's been a teaching golf pro to players at all skill levels since '94. Slot earned his membership to the Professional Golfers Association of America in 1998. You may have seen him on the Golf Channel or read any number of his instructional articles in Golf Illustrated, Virginia Golfer, and Virginia Golf Report. And Tim DeJarre is based in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. He became a member of the PGA in 1999. In addition to working as a golf pro, Tim was the CEO of Hill Club, Hill Golf Club, and is now manager for Swing Catalyst USA. Swing Catalyst provides golf video analysis software, biomechanical analysis of foot pressure distribution, as well as other ball flight and club tracking tools. So in just a second, I'd like to turn this over to Abet. He's gonna lead our discussion. Time for Q&A. If you've got questions for the panel, it's through the Q&A panel that you'll see over in the right hand uh, half in your uh, WebEx window. So I hope you enjoy the hour. If you're joining us with the golf club within reach, just remember you're probably inside. So I bet with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Uh, you're very kind to call me an expert uh, golfer, but uh, you know, full disclosure, my index right now is at 14. I started at 12, got a new set of clubs, and it's up two strokes, so I'm working back down. Uh, but I have uh, a bevy of uh, instructors around me, and I'm hoping to do better, including with the help of SLOT down in Kinlock. Um, so I'm really excited to have, uh, to, to be able to host this, this presentation. And uh, we're going to do four questions that we're going to circulate around the, around the panelists. And of course, uh, the participants the, the out there in the crowd can uh, enter their questions on the Q&A, as Cynthia had said. So I am going to ask the first question 
which is what do you consider are the proper elements and sequence of a repeatable golf swing? And I'll start with Slot. Uh, thanks, Abed. Appreciate, appreciate y'all for letting me be part of this today. Um, sequence of motion, if there's a key element to the golf swing, folks, I really believe sequence of motion might be it. Uh, can't tell you how many times someone said, boy, they, the, the, the guys and girls on tour, they make it look so easy. And if you're up close, they're flying. But the reason why they make it look so easy is just the proper sequence of events, uh, the proper sequence of emotion, the kinetic motion, which uh, allows the swing to fall into place. And I guess um, the easiest way to explain that, and I'm sure you may have heard this term, is starting the downswing from the ground up. Meaning, when we get to the top of the backswing, you know, I basically have a job because most of us start our move to the golf ball towards impact from starting from up top, whether that be the arms, the hands, and the club initiated downswing, or whether that may, that, uh, that may be an overactive upper body initiated downswing. So sequentially, that person's flawed. They're going to have a hard time getting into proper positions to secure proper impact or even uh, good ball plays. So proper sequence of motion on that downswing, working from the ground up, meaning when we get to the top of our backswing, feeling the lower half, whether that be in a lateral motion and a, uh, or, and or rotational motion, letting that motion from the ground, which Tim will certainly touch on later, letting the sequence of starting the swing from the ground up and let it, letting that unfurl, that motion from the ground, lower half going, then bringing the upper half, then bringing the arms and the hands and the club into the hitting zone. You know, an easy way to think about it sometimes is we can actually put ourselves in really good impact position at the top of the backswing. If we, if we make a backswing, we can actually secure a pretty good impact position up here. And if we don't do anything up top, whether it be torso, arms, hands, shaft, club head, if we just remain passive and let the lower half initiate and start the, uh, the, the downswing sequence, the kinetic action, and then bring in the upper body. It can almost deliver the passive arms and hands right to the hitting zone four. So again, initiating the downswing from the ground up. And I know it's a very vague term, but I think it's absolutely critical to have any chance to get into pre-impact or impact positions or to try to get the consistency of impact, speed, or even desired ball flights. Just critical. That's terrific. Uh, thank you, Slot. And Tim, I'd like to ask you the same question, uh, if you have any different views about that or, or consistent with what Slot said. No, I, I would definitely say that I agree with what Slot's saying, that it starts from the ground up. I mean, I've been lucky to be with Swing Cattles for eight years now and, and watching a lot of different swings from the average golfer to the Tour Pro. There is a, a sequence that does happen, and like Slot saying that, there is that, that little bit of a push off from the the ground, so you get that lateral movement, and then you have the rotation coming second, and then the last is the vertical. So every golfer ha does have that move, but to be the most consistent and most effective, it should go in that order. It should, you know, the push up or the horizontal, then the rotational, and then the vertical. And the best, can I interject one thing? Sure. Matt and Tim, I, again, I agree 100%. Um, and, and one thing I think when, when I decide to, to maybe discuss of motion, I think sometimes we neglect the sequence of the backswing. You know, equally important, I think, at times, folks, is how do we initiate the backswing. So many of us tend to snatch the club away with the hands. So you'll see the club head, the arms, the hands, the shaft, and then the body turns. Well, the sequence of backswing is, is critical as well to setting up the tempo and the rhythm and the transition into the sequence of downswing. And sometimes, Boy, if you ever watch tour events, you always watch these nice waggles off the ball where they actually feel like their torso, arms, hands, and club head are almost starting the backswing in this nice together instead of having the arms and the hands kind of snatch the club head away. So again, if you're struggling, sometimes it never hurts to focus on sequence of backswing where the torso, arms, hands, club almost start the backswing together. Thank you. Sean, I'd like to ask you about what your views are on sequence. Well, I am an engineer and not a PGA professional. So uh, that being said, I don't have all that much to say. Uh, as we were developing our technology, we have been working with some PGA teaching professionals. And what we've been trying to concentrate on is four major moves um, in the golf swing. Uh, 
first two in the backswing and, and then the other two in the downswing. And so our technology will allow you to kind of get some instant feedback when you're not with your teaching professional, letting you know if you're doing that sequence as, as Slot was talking about. Awesome, that's great. So uh, we're 10 minutes in, so we're on schedule. I'd like to ask the second question, which is I'm gonna to pose to Sean. How can I use technology to help my golf swing when I'm away from a golf swing instructor? Yeah, so as I as I already alluded to, uh, what our technology will do is very much like Swing Catalyst where you're videoing your swing. Um, what we're doing is we're taking that video and applying some biometric markers that are all markerless and using that to analyze your motion and then predict what maybe the fault was in that motion and then give you some instruction of what you might want to do to improve um, while that movement is still in muscle memory and we and it has the advantage of being able to give you that feedback while you are on your own at the driving range one of the things that we've seen looking at thousands and thousands of videos is when somebody takes a swing and they don't have any instruction they can tend to continue to repeat that same mistake over and over and over again and our goal is to give them some feedback and say look your your hips are moving um, in that back swing let's try to instead rotate your hips more or you know and those types of instructions just to help get the basic golf swing solid um, when we've been working with our teaching professional um, you know he said 90 percent of golfers have problems in with sway or sliding back falling back um, and if we can help fix those types of problems, we'll make people enjoy the game more, hopefully seek out professional instruction and actually help grow the game of golf. <laughs> and and so, Louie has uh, something to say about all that. <laughs> I, I, uh, I tend to go, uh, because I live in Clarendon, Virginia, uh, Ains Point is only about a five, six minute drive for me, so I tend to go over there. And boy, what you say is true, because I could be in a bay next to somebody and, uh, you know, I don't know what they're doing in the next bay, but all I hear is curses and, and you know, they're not having a good time. So I'm sure that uh, if they can get some instruction from your device uh, while they're out there, they're going to be a lot happier for sure. Yeah. Or worse yet, their friend is helping them. And, you know, that can cause a whole other series of problems and undo <laughs> right. any good instruction that they had been receiving from their instructor. So we're trying to make sure that when people are away from their instructors, they're getting some, some good coaching. The instructor knows what they're getting and we can reinforce good habits. All right. So I'd like to post that same question to Tim and maybe you can add to what Sean is saying about what we as golfers, when we're practicing, should be thinking about or, or how, how we can reinforce any instructions that we received while, while we were with the instructor. And I appreciate that. And I, I agree with Sean that if you can have any type of technology to help you out uh, while you're trying to make those changes and anything that you can use to actually see the changes as well, so you, you know you're going in the right direction. So like for our company, we have a, a Swing Kettles app that you can use. You can video your swing, uh, you can compare it so you can see those changes. And also too, if you're at home, you could send those swings you know, to your instructor. So you could send it to Slot, he has swing kettles there. He could then review the swing as well and send it back to you. So um, really having some type of technology is really better than not having anything, trying to work it on your own. And, and I would say as over the years, I have uh, also found that a lot of couples, they swing very similar because they're always giving tips to each other. So. Um, maybe by using <laughs> their technology or something, they can, might be able to change it up a little bit, so. And after all, our swings are individual at some point, right? So uh, we can't all have the same swing. Right. I hope that's true, anyway. <laughs> uh, Slot, would you like to add to that, please? Well, no, I think uh, the, what Tim and Sean said is, is, is huge. It's kind of the way we're going as well. Like when we were closed, recent example, when we were closed early on in the pandemic, you know, for two weeks, I was only able to connect uh, with students via the, the Swing Catalyst app. Um, and, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful to, to be able to, to keep that on point with the one or two things they're focused on. It's wonderful for folks that go to Florida for the winter and they're away from you. It's wonderful for the folks that, want to go and play and compete and are on the road for three or four weeks and they want to shoot you something. 
Um, it, it just, it, it, it's the way we're going and, and it's phenomenal to be able to stay in touch with people just to make sure that they're out there when they are practicing, they're getting after the right things and staying on point. It's, it's been a great tool and there's no doubt it's the way we're going. I think it's invaluable actually. Well, Sean, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about how your app is, is coming along and, and what a, a user experience is going to be like when, when you use it. Like you said that there's somebody going to be talking. Are you going to be using your voice in the app or what? Sure. So what we do is um, our mobile app is still in development, but we uh, you set up your um, mobile phone or a iPad or something like that to video a face on swing. And what you'll do is once you're in the uh, T box, you can say the word ready and the system will then beep. When you hear the beep, that tells you that it's recording. You can go ahead and take your swing. Um, as soon as your swing is finished, you, there'll be a second double beep. Um, and then depending on your choice of how you want the output, it will talk to you and tell you what you need to do, very much like Alexa talks to you, or you can also get a visual graphic on your phone that'll give you some instructions. It'll show what your fault is and give you an idea of what you need to do um, to address that fault. Uh, then all you have to do is say the word ready and the whole process starts again. One of the things we've noticed using uh, the version without the coaching is that it ends up being a really nice tool to just kind of work on the timing of your swing because you say ready, you get a swing, then you can kind of pause and then say ready. And so it really works on some swing timing as well. That was a uh, an unforeseen benefit of the whole process. And we've been We've been collecting videos um, for a while now, and we are in the process of refining the AI so that we can then deliver it quickly. It gets delivered within 10 seconds before you take your next swing. So it's a very immediate feedback, hence the name of the company, um, uh, experience. That sounds great, and I look forward to getting, uh, uh, what do you think you, you'll get a prototype out there? We are currently focusing on a, uh, a business client, um, and so our direct-to-consumer product is, um, is it's going to be a little bit out there, but um, you might be seeing it in more like driving ranges and things like that in the, in the near future. That's terrific. So, Tim, I haven't had the uh, chance to, uh, to actually use Swing Catalyst myself. You know, how about uh, giving us a little quick primer on how it works? Well, Swing Catalyst, it's, it's a software company. And, Based, based in Trondheim, Norway, so it's a video software company, but I think a lot of people do know us mainly from the sensor plate side of, of how it works. So we're a fully integrated software company, so not only do we have multiple cam camera angles uh, through video, so you can have four camera positions, and it's synchronized with our sensor plate, so it's a balanced plate or even a force plate. And we also integrate foresight full swing launch monitors and flight scope launch monitors. So it's fully integrated so that when you hit a shot, the launch monitor can trigger the video. It goes back two seconds or three seconds, cuts the video from the four camera angles. It's all synchronized together with not only the foot pressure, but also then has the ball flight information all saved together. So that's basically how it works. That's great. Well, um, let's move on to our third question now, which is, uh, does my footwear make a difference in my performance? And uh, Tim, why don't you start us off? Yeah, I appreciate the question and, and the opportunity. So with working with Swing Catalyst for, you know, like I mentioned, eight years, we found that the software produces a trace. And but I, I sent over uh, a, a presentation or at least a couple of slides there, if you could throw them up when you have a moment. But uh, our technology, our sensor plate has over 2,000 sensors on it, and it allows you to see how you stand. So it gives you your stance width and how you're standing percentage-wise. And then as you make the swing, there's a certain movement or trace that's produced. And over the years, we've been watching these traces and finding out that shoes uh, do have some correlation in regards to the trace. So we noticed one if you could pull it up there, of, of Ricky Fowler, that this was in 2015 uh, tour event. We had him swing off of the, the swing cattle system, and the trace is very long because he has a conventional uh, golf shoes. 
And then in 2016, Puma sent him those those high top shoes uh, that kind of buckles in around his ankle, and and uh, you know you can see it just in his his shot that you know the trace is much shorter. So I'll you bet. Can you throw up that slide up there? Yeah, uh, I thought I did. Yeah. So what I produce is a slide here where you can see the difference between the the two traces. So. You see the, the one there says contemporary golf shoes. You see all the traces, it's much longer. It's a little bit more fluid. So he has a little bit more freedom there. And prior to 2016, he had a pretty successful uh, tour career. And then in 16, I know he had a little bit uh, struggles there on tour, but you can see all the trace had changed. So um, his you know physical, the swing hadn't really changed because the limitation of the, the shoes. So if you go to the next one, uh, what we had the, in uh, 2018 was Suzanne Pedersen came to our booth. She's part owner. She's uh, Norwegian. Uh, she always came to our booth and did a little presentation. And the top one with her running shoes on, she's sponsored by Nike. And, you know, as walk around the PGA show floor, you want some comfortable shoes. So she's walking and she, she said, I'll come up and hit some shots. So she was hitting, hitting some shots. And if you see how the trace kind of goes from uh, that middle between her feet, uh, how it goes over, then it goes like a straight line up towards her, her right uh, tool there and then back across. Well, we haven't really seen that with her trace before. And you can also see with the distance, she hits at 119 yards and then it actually backed up uh, five yards on a simulator, which you'd rarely see. So some strange things were happening there. So that's not her normal trace. And also we don't really see someone, you know, moving forward that much on their toes uh, in transition. So we asked her actually to take her shoes off. So the lower one to the right, you can see how the, that little gray trace there is a little bit more full, like it's a little bit more rounded. So that's more typical of her movement and it didn't throw her up you know, towards the toes when she was swinging. So at that point, we're thinking, well, shoes must have you know, a little bit of a difference uh, with the golf swing. And if you pull the third one, uh, have the opportunity to. So let me interrupt you for a second. I see that the distance is very different between the two shots there. Yeah, because she's not moving so much on her toes and she's a little bit more in the middle of the foot and has a little bit more of a, a transfer moving towards the target rather than towards her toes. There's more momentum moving towards the, the ball or more rotation. So it will allow for a little bit more club at speed, which is more distance. 15 yards at the same club. <laughs> Yeah, just a yeah, a few swings later by taking off her shoes. So, and then that was uh, this year. I had the opportunity to go to Under Armour. So Jordan Smith was launching his new uh, golf shoes that are kind of custom for him, but it has a, a hard like graphite bottom to it, and it's a very kind of restrictive shoe. But it's comfortable for him, and he kind of needs that stability. So um, he came in prior to doing a demo for everyone. He just wanted to warm up on the system, so he had his you know, basic tennis shoes on, and they're very similar to his uh, golf shoes in regards to, you know, they're not like a, a, a high running shoe. Uh, the platform is very similar to his golf shoes. And he, hit, you know, without warming up, he had three shots. And you can see that uh, if you look at the forces, he created 149% of vertical force, which is a uh, somewhat of, or it, it is actually a, in correlation in regards to club head speed, the more you can create for most people, the more club head speed you can create. So with him just hitting a few shots in his tennis shoes, uh, he you know, created some decent numbers, but it wasn't as though when he changed shoes and put into his custom shoes. And you can see the forest, again, without warming up, he just hit three shots again. He creates 184% vertical forest. And unfortunately, we didn't have a launch bar to see the, the distance uh, change there. But at that point, I talked with Under Armour, and we're actually in the process of doing a 2020 shoe project. Now it's sold down because of the pandemic, unfortunately, but uh, we have three sets of shoes out. Uh, two are here in the United States with the exact same uh, shoe size. Uh, one's very one's very flexible, one's kind of in between. So it's like the three little piggies are out there. And um, what we're doing is we're just getting uh, information in regards to types of swings and how shoes can make a difference. So we have one set in Europe and two here in the United States. And we'll be hopefully coming out with Under Armour with a little, you know, 
display of, of how shoes can make a difference or if you can actually gain yardage by changing shoes. Well, that's terrific. Uh, Slot, how, what about your experience with shoes? Oh, absolutely. So um, here at Kenlock, we are fortunate enough to have a full-time athletic trainer and physical therapist. And for years now, we have tried to fit people in certain orthotics, even before we had the swing cat technology. Uh, for someone that maybe had some knee or hip issues and were lateral in their backswing, maybe they needed some sort of orthotic or assistance. Or if we had an individual who was maybe getting top heavy in, in, in transition, well, you would never recommend a high, uh, uh, pronounced heel golf shoe. So pretty inexact science. We didn't have the technology that's available now. But, but the footwear has something that we certainly, uh, especially with the, with the person, the, the, uh, uh, with the person, the fitted orthotics, something that we tried to match up to an individual's either gait or, or the way they moved in the golf swing to help for sure. Absolutely. I think that's huge. Sean, would you like to add to that, please? I, I have nothing to add. I, I don't. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Well, uh, if I could just add one one quick thing there, like Saad had said with the, the higher souls there, is that I was at a, an event and there was an individual trying to hit a draw and looking at the trace, he was very much on his toes and it's hard to hit a draw from the toes unless you just want to pull it. But um, we we're trying to get him more on his heel and in the backswing, but with the high, you know, like running shoes he had, it was just impossible for him to really get more into the heel so he could produce a more in to out, you know, club at, uh, or path. So there is a correlation in regards to the, the, the way in which you use the ground in, re, in regards to how the swing is traveling. So we actually had him take his shoes off and he was able to get more pressure into his, his trail heel so he could move out towards the ball or swing it more to the right, causing the ball to hit, you know, to have a drop. So uh, I just want to make make sure it's clear in my own mind that when I'm wearing these golf shoes or whatever shoes I'm wearing, do I want them to be springy or not? You, you know, in terms of uh, my ability to, to feel the ground, you know, I feel a little bit more athletic with what I'm wearing, running shoes versus golf shoes. You know, what should I be looking for? For, for me, I, well, Slot, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Go ahead, Sam. No, um, I mean, obviously, if if you're walking the golf course, you want very you want comfortable shoes. I mean, I think you really want to enjoy the game. I think that's the part, you know, number one. You don't want to be in pain walking around the golf course. Uh, the second thing too is that regarding your shot pattern and the stability of the shoe, like if you're you're kind of inconsistent or hitting a little bit behind the ball, you might have a shoe that's too flexible because your pressure is going to the outside. I see a lot of people that have, you know, their golf shoes are worn out on the outside of their shoe because there's a lot of movement from side to side. So, uh, you know, again, you want comfortable shoes and then really to try to find a shoe that's that's stable for you that allows you to hit the golf ball well. And and if you're looking to create, you know, a fade, you might want a higher uh, heel foot uh, or shoe. And if you want your draws, you might want a lower one. There's nothing in the game of rules that you can't change shoes between shots. So you can actually <laughs> switch shoes if you want to get a paint or a drop. But so and that's what the caddies are for, too, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, um, it's uh, about about one thirty now, so we're almost. Uh, we've got like ten minutes, eleven minutes left for the last question. Then we're going to go to the Q and A for the audience. So the last question is. Everyone strives for a consistent swing from shot to shot, but what can I do in between rounds to help me get more consistent from round to round? So, uh, Sean, how about you? Let's start with you. And, uh, okay, you're Self off mute there. Uh, so that was really the whole reason why we started feedback um, was to help you while you're when you're not actually out there enjoying the game of golf um, to be consistent and and to improve while you're taking a swing. And so, from our perspective, what we are what we are in why we developed our tool was to allow you to get that feedback while the motion is still in your muscle memory and um, and not practice the wrong thing over and over and over again. Uh, so 
you know, that getting feedback, regardless from technology or from a teaching professional, from, from our perspective is really uh, key to improving your golf game. Slot, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that is, is first off, it is practicing what the purpose of it is. Two, two answers to that is one, when we do practice between rounds, I think one of the things that we neglect to do is at times practice like we play. So if you're going to go hit balls for an hour, and let's say you're, you know, if that, let's say you're working on picking around that backside, hitting your, your backswing. Well, get your work in. There's going to, yeah, we have to get your reps in on that, but we also eventually have to practice like we play, meaning going through your pre shot routine and things that you're going to do when you get on the tee box. So sometimes we don't quite do that when we practice. We tend to play in one in one mode and practice another. So we need to integrate our practice like we play when we do practice. And the other thing, kind of to Sean's point, is analyze your rounds. Look, I've had so many people say, hey, how'd you play the other day? Well, I played terrible. Well, tell me about it. Well, I hit 15 greens in rain, but I had 48 punch. We didn't play terrible. You played like him. Okay, so what we need to do is to find out, am I missing greens? Where am I missing them? Short, right, long? Am I not hitting fairways? Am I not getting up and down out of bunker? Is my short game suffering? And then, since we only have a certain amount of time to practice, is focus on your weaknesses. Man, if you drive the ball great, but your short game's terrible, man, get on the short game practice area. Make that a strength if you're going to drive the ball well. So I would say working on your weaknesses between rounds and then also finding a way to integrating practice like you play, going through your pre-shot routine, changing clubs, changing targets, ch changing sizes of swings, uh, which is more of what we do when we do play. So, Tim, do you think it's more, uh, you know, just a function or a physiology, too? I mean, there are days when I feel like I can put every shot exactly where I want it to be, and then the next day, I forgot how to swing a golf club, you know? Yeah. No, that happens to all of us, and, and it is, is a difficult thing, but I agree with, with Sean and, and also Slot that, you know, trying to get the feedback and, and making changes and, and practice like you play is a big thing but like you say even just keeping a diary i think that would be kind of my add-in because you're right i think when you wake up in the morning sometimes you feel like boy I, you know, what is this what is this game you know i haven't seen it before so by keeping a diary is kind of nice because then you can uh, you can also look back to see you know what did i eat the day before what did i drink the day before you know because all that you know puts in to you know how you wake up and feel the next day so I know that so I do keep a diary and, and you know, on the PGA Tour, you have nutrition nutritionists and they have the physical therapists and they're all there to help the player to play its best. And unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to have all those people around us when we wake up in the morning to go out and play. But uh, if we can eat, uh, keep a diary, uh, exercise, uh, it is, you know, the more you can get all the information, I think you can have it so you're going to play good the next day. Thank you. So, uh, Slot, I think we got a couple of minutes. So, if you want to just uh, take us around Ken Luck a little bit there. I couldn't download on my phone a bit. I'm sorry. I can't. <laughs> okay. my, 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 I'm sorry. That, that's okay. That's, that's fine. So, uh, anyway, if there's any other closing messages you guys might have individually, uh, I'd like to hear them now, please. So, Slot, if, if there's anything you'd like to leave the audience before we go to questions. Um, uh, you know, I guess, I guess as far as swing goes or, 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 or game goes, you know, don't be afraid to, to, to find the ball flight that you, do, that, that you can perform most of the time. And, again, depending on how much you play or practice, listen, if you're working on hitting a draw but you hit a fade 98% of the time, yeah, that's fine. Keep trying to work on hitting a draw, whatever case may be. But my gosh, when you get between the lines and you're playing, go to a shot that you trust. If you know it's going to fade, then play it. You know, don't see a draw if you haven't hit one in three years. Um, what you can do, and the other thing I would say for maybe you golfers that are maybe a little more advanced, is have a go-to shot. Meaning, okay, I normally play a little baby high draw, low right to left draw most of the time, but I'm I'm five over through six holes. I'm hitting pushes and hooks. Try to come up with a go-to shot. Maybe it's, okay, I know that I can hit a, a kind of hold off punch shot all the way around. Maybe I can learn how to hit a squeeze cut. So when, when plan A fails and your tip and your normal isn't there, try to practice having a go-to shot to help you get through that round of golf. 
and still uh, manufacture a good score. Sean, how about you? Well, like I said, we are really about that uh, that golfer who might have to go out and play with their boss and doesn't want to go embarrass themselves. And so our type of solution is uh, is out there so you can go practice, get some feedback on on helping you feel consistent about that swing and um, and and just feel good about playing the game of golf. Awesome, that's great. Tim, any parting uh, messages? Um, you know, I think what everyone's saying is great stuff. And I think that for the most part, again, that the game of golf should be fun. So just go up and, and have fun. If it's going a little crooked, just, you know, stick with it and, and try to make the best out of it. Okay, great. So I think uh, we can get started with the questions if you guys are game for that. So the first question is, uh, what's the best way to pitch a new concept for an on-course play management tool to golf course leadership? Can, can, you, can you guys see that question? Oh, I, I can't see it. Uh, you might want to turn on your chat. Um, you can see the blue button on the bottom that says uh, chat. Actually, it won't turn blue until you cl click on it. It's right next to the three dots. Oh, there. So what's the best way to pitch a new concept for an on-course play management tool to golf course leadership? I'm not so sure that any of us are capable of answering that question, but I'll let you guys give it a shot. I'm going to pass on that one a bit. Yeah, I think. Yes, yeah, John, uh, Jonathan Ireland there. Maybe uh, he uh -huh. could answer that question. Uh, folks, Jonathan Ireland is the general manager at Kinlock. He's probably best to, to, to uh, answer that question. Tim, did you have anything? Any thoughts about that? Well, um, be, because with, with our technology, there are a lot of golf facilities that would like to have. The you know sensor plates or a video system in there, and I think that because most facilities have today a launch monitor um, that to track the ball, and it seems like that's the way we've, we've been teaching a lot these last few years is a little bit from video, a little bit from the launch monitors, and like slots started out right away talking about kind of the geography of like what's happening up here, and I think we all tend to to work that way from you know from the top down. So I think maybe to you know, pitch this to a management would be to, you know, the, the way we swing the golf club is from the ground up. You know, if you ever swung on ice before, you, you just twist. You, you need some stability on the ground. So to pitch it, I would say that, you know, for our company, and of course, managing Swing Couch USA, I'd love to have every golf facility using our product. But the, the using the ground is kind of a, a new tool, even though it's been around many years. But now there's so much education behind it. But uh, to go in there trying to you know push the fact that you use the ground and and to kind of get it into the management that way Sean I, I really haven't had any experience in that area so I can't really add anything right okay well the next question is a sort of a high class problem here so what's the best way for a scratch golfer to use technology to improve the game I would say I'll jump in here. If, if you're that accomplished of a player, I mean, this, this swing countless technology, this ground force technology, I, I think is, is, is phenomenal. Um, if you're that good and, and, and even to go from a scratch to a plus, you know, it's a little difficult, but boy, the, the fine details that, that you can get game wise and swing wise, being more precise with, with the ground and not just, jumping off of it or rotating faster, but if we're changing your pressure trace to change a ball flight. Um, I would say get into minutia of, of something like the, the, the swing callus ground force technology. And then also uh, obviously tap into the technology, the track mans, the foresights, you know, the hack motions for wrist positions. If you're trying to go to that next level, it might be a really small deal. 
and, and some of this great technology can get into minutiae that maybe you cannot see with the naked eye or you can feel what we're doing on our own. It makes me the ideal uh, student because I'm only looking for uh, incremental improvements, like five swings maybe. <laughs> the offer is looking for one stroke or two strokes here and there. Okay, so uh, we're waiting for a couple more questions, hopefully, to come, come in. Um, really appreciate you guys uh, participating in this uh, while we wait for some more questions. I think that, uh, you know, it's been uh, very educational for me to listen to you guys talk, so I appreciate that. So we got uh, another question. Uh, can I use this technology with my phone, or what is the investment I need to improve? And I think that depends on what technology we're talking about here. So, uh, Sean, why don't you um, take that one first? Right. When we release um, the Feedback Coach technology is a mobile, it, it will be a mobile app, so available for Android and iPhone. And we're looking at a membership type pricing. So it would be about $50 a month. Great. But that's uh, on, on the mobile app and, and also the iPad, right? Correct. And you could use that on any mobile app. Um, and it also includes, uh, in addition to the coaching, it includes some, some basic analysis tools where you can draw construction lines, um, and kind of scrub your video, look at that back, sw back swing, uh, share that video with instructors, and, and do some other types of tools. Great. Well, Tim, uh, how about Swing Catalyst? Yeah, Swing Catalyst, we have an app that's available on Android and uh, iOS. It's free to download, free to use. It allows you to capture your video, to do comparisons, to draw lines. You can even download some tour players if you decide you want to compare against a tour player swing. And then our app also allows you to the opportunity to send your swing either on social media to a friend that also has downloaded the Swing Catalyst app or to instructors. You could actually send your swing to Slot. Slot could do a, a lesson recording, send it right back to you right on your device. And Slot, I'm sure you've seen a lot of technology in your day. And, and I'm actually, I, I do know that one of my friends has a, you know, something like a TrackMan on an iPhone now. Yeah, they're everywhere. Uh, phones, tablets, uh, we have so many people now that are setting up their own uh, golf houses in, in their backyard, uh, in an old shed or a room. Uh, but especially with the launch monitor technology, it's so easy. Uh, there's a lot of that screw into the end of the club. Uh, this is actually set up for foresight technology. You see the markers on the, the, the club face. You got TrackMan, but yeah, it's everywhere. It's phones. Every, everybody has a heck watch it. You see guys out on a range look at their watch and know that it went 179 yards with the X launch, X club head speed. Yeah, the, the, the launch monitor technology is everywhere. And and also with what the, the Swing Cat app and what Sean's got going on. So it's out there if you want to get better. Uh, so one of the things that spurred um, us to develop feedback was there, as a slot saying, there are lots and lots of options out there that will provide you data about your golf swing. Um, but a lot of us don't know, okay, great, my club head is five degrees open. But I don't know what I'm supposed to do to fix the fact that my club head is five degrees open. And a lot of these tools out there will give you that type of information, but not, they'll give you data, but they don't necessarily give you instruction. And so that was, that's kind of a key component to all this as you think about how you want to improve your game is, do you already have the knowledge for how to translate that data into what you need to do to improve? Do you need to couple that with a teaching professional? Or in our case, we tried to do that for you by providing that coupling to the actual instruction. And so those are all things to think about as you are looking at making that investment in technology. Great, thank you. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of this one, but the, what is foresight technology and how does it work? Anybody hear about foresight? Yeah, foresight is, uh, I'm sorry, Tim. Um, it, it's basically just a company that specializes. They, they do simulators, golf simulators and such, but it's also what it specializes in. It, it's a launch monitor. It's a launch monitor. Yeah, it's a launch monitor. We, we, we happen to have a, uh, a quad, quad uh, the new quad, uh, and we have multiple track mains as well. It's just another brand of launch monitor. 
um, been, been really good to us. Really good ball data, very good club data. I have a question for Slot. How do you use that technology for club fitting? Well, I don't do the club fitting. We have a couple of systems that do club fitting, and, and, and that technology is vast to use. Our, our track is really, really big in club fitting. Um, I will integrate uh, the foresight every now and then in, in instruction. Mm -hmm. We might be trying to change someone's angle of attack with a driver, you know, level it out, whatever case may be. We went, might want to see spin rates on wedges. We might want to see attack angles with six irons. So um, we do use the instruction, just try to integrate it um, very uh, tastefully. And, 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 but yeah, it, it's valuable. It's valuable. But I, I think, Sean, I think the point you made earlier when we talked, there's a gluttony of technology out there for us to get better in golf. And, and I think your point is spot on. Like Sean said, our, our club face might be five, to, oh, five degrees open at impact. You need to have a base understanding of why is my club face open five degrees in, open at impact. Because right. it's going to be different than Sean's or Tim's or Abet's. I have to understand how it works for me. How do I square it up? So, but yeah, you need to have that baseline now. How does my golf swing work? Not the golf swing. How does my golf swing work? So. So Tim, what uh, what should be the budget technology budget of your average golfer? What what, what can we get away with, uh, you know, without having to build a, a fifty thousand dollar hitting bay in my basement? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. There, um, yeah, the you know, a lot of people would just want. Um, well, right now I find in, especially because of the pandemic with everyone being home, everyone's looking for like a gaming simulator. So like slot headset, uh, foresight, they're the person that brought up about foresight, uh, you know, having an, an indoor uh, simulator is, is a lot of fun, definitely. Um, from our side, of course, if you can add in the video component as well, so not only can you have some fun playing the game, you can analyze your swing. Uh, we do have the sensor plate, like I said, but um, budget-wise, from our side, it could be from basically forty-nine dollars a month with uh, an investment of maybe two hundred and fifty dollars for the camera, uh, and then then forty-nine dollars a month for the software. But if you did get into the sensor plate, our sensor plate start starts at seven thousand dollars. So if you had a if you had a budget of right around seven eight thousand dollars, you could get into swing cows with a sensor plate. Uh, for the ground force, but otherwise, if you're just looking for just the video side, you could go free from the app, or you could get, you know, a camera ranging from two hundred fifty dollars up to a thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, we have a, a fairly uh, fundamental question here that you know some people may not know what a launch monitor is. So, how does that work? So, there's different. There's Two different types of launch monitors out in the market today. I'm, I don't sell launch monitor, but um, I there there's like TrackMan and FlightScope are launch monitors, and they're radar. So basically, what they do is they track the ball. So when the balls hit, the the radar will follow, track the ball, so it protracts the spin rate, the maneuvering of the ball, the dv you know the deviation distance from the target, um, compiles all that information, and now it's gotten to the point where they've added. The club data as well, so you get attack angle, uh, how the ball or how the club's coming in the ball, a smash factor on um, where it's being hit on the club face, uh, how the, how it's moving along a plane. So all that information. Um, so that's a radar, and then foresight is camera based. So that's I think it's a thousand frames per second uh, camera based system, which again it's it tracks the club head itself, how it's coming into hit, hitting the ball, it um, doesn't estimate on where it's being hit. Like the, the radars estimate that it's a solid hit, that it's always hit right in the middle of the club head. Uh, foresight can tell you where it's hit on the club because obviously if you hit on the, well, not obviously, but if you hit on the toe or heel, it will affect the spin and, and how the ball travels. Both radars, again, they will measure attack angles, smash factors, uh, swing planes, those types of things. It's just that one is camera-based and one's a radar. So I don't know, Saad, if you want to add to that. Well, I, I was just going to tend to respond on. I think the one thing I was going to say is what I have found is that the camera-based, like the foresight, I think the ball data is, is eerily similar to your radar-based tracking. So the ball data is insignificant, maybe a couple hundred RPMs, maybe a mile per hour or two. 
but I think the club data, the actual strike, where because it takes pictures, uh, I think the club data is much more accurate on a foresight camera-based um, launch monitor versus a radar-based like a track. But they're both really. Uh, I have to like the foresight a little better than track. Because I think the club that is is better than, than the track. Do you guys know what the difference in price is between those two systems? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm speaking out of school here a little bit. I, I think our foresight GC pod might might have been seventeen thousand five hundred when we got it, while TrackMan at the same would have been twenty four twenty five. So the foresight GC quad was about five six, probably six thousand dollars less than a TrackMan. So the only negative to the foresight is you do have to put, a, depending on what kind of information you're looking for, you actually have to apply stickers on your club because it is capturing, it is taking pictures of that. But that's the only downside of maybe a foresight. It's cheaper, uh, the club data is better, the ball data is, you know, basically identical to TrackMan. Yeah, and it is cheaper. It's good. It's good stuff. There's something that I've always uh, been curious about is, is there's been a lot of talk about, uh, you know, matching your club head speed with the kind of ball that you, you play with. Could you guys care to make a comment about that? Is there a relationship and is there really a, a, a good match for you? Oh, I think I guess Sean, Tim, if you don't mind, I'll jump in here. Um, I think it's critical to match. When we go through club fittings, it should also be a golf ball fitting. Um, matching, uh, one, am I looking for more distance? Am I looking for more control around the greens? Does my ball come out flat and not spin enough to stay in the air? Does my ball spin too much of the balloon in the air? Um, so yeah, I, I think getting a golf ball that, that is going to match, because again, matching it up to the way you deliver the club, high spin, low spin, low launch, high launch, uh, low club head speed, high club head speed. Um, do I check the ball around the greens? Do I bump and run? So, uh, Ball fitting is right up there with club fitting. It, it should be one and the same. Every time you get club fit or go through an analyzation of your game, uh, ball fitting is equally important as what kind of shaft, what kind of club fit, what kind of wedge and puck. Yeah, for sure. Tim, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think slot's spot on with that. I think that if you're if you're playing a ball that you know is not matched up to you, it could actually cost you a few shots around. Be honest so you could almost lower your score just by changing you know to the to the right ball that matches your swing or what you're trying to do out there yeah sean do you know if there's any uh you know i mean who's who's competent to do that kind of a ball uh ball matching yeah it's not my area of expertise i'm sorry oh i think about i think any qualified club fitter could help you with that I really do, and and and, and basically, it's, it's now they would have to have knowledge of, of various golf balls, like they would various shafts, as they would various club heads. But again, we're, there, there's an optimal everything for all of us. There's an op, based on the way we deliver a club individually and the speed that we create. There's an optimal launch and an optimal amount of spin that we would like to see in our golf shots. Um, and then having launch monitors like Foresight, like TrackMan. Um, helps you find that. Again, if I launch my driver too low with high spin, okay, well, let's see if we can't get you to launch it uh, higher with less spin, and then you just match up the golf all that. But yeah, I mean, I think any competent club fitter or equipment person would be able to help with that. As, excuse me, as long as they had enough knowledge of all the different golf balls. Well, I hope that you guys uh, out there in the audience have enjoyed our presentation this afternoon. And if you have any other questions, please pose them and we'll try to get them answered by our panel. And, uh, you know, I want you guys to, to, to go out there and, and, and enjoy the game of golf, but at the same time, we obviously, you know, need to stay safe in what we're doing. And so I caution everyone to be vigilant, uh, try to keep uh, the distancing uh, guidelines going. And I'd like to close up by uh, just turning it back over to to Cynthia and uh, having her uh, close up the remarks. Well, first of all, thank you so much to our panel, Sean, Slot, Tim, and our moderator, Abat. Um, I can't thank you all for joining us. You know, there's a, 
a tremendous amount of technology behind the game of golf. And I think, you know, lots of folks think about sports and they don't really think about the data and the science and the technology behind it. And so hopefully uh, you've had the opportunity to, to really appreciate what goes into so what's fun for an awful lot of us. So joining us, uh, you can always find more information on the MIT Enterprise Forum of, of Washington and find a copy of this event on our website. And that is MITEFDC.org. And for those of you that um, uh, were uh, courteous enough to spend some time with us today, I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. And uh, uh, stay safe out there. So thanks again, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye.